Hi, and welcome to Chip Theory Games. I'm Logan Giannini, and today we're going to learn the solo only game of. <coughs> Hampdog79, this one's for you, so you can learn the game now. We're going to do a little Hoplomachus Victorum how to play. So let's dive right in with the setup. So let's just go ahead and get this monstrosity open. We'll throw this off over to the side. So I'm just going to throw some things off to the side to start. And the first thing that you really want for your play area is going to be the big rolled up mat. So first you're going to get your giant console mat laid out like so. Next we're going to grab our stadium seating and when it has chips in it, be sure to hold it firmly from both ends. Place it above the console mat like this. You can take the lid off and you can either use the lid as a stand, you can set it right in there if you wish, or you can just place it like so and you can set the lid off to the side elsewhere. Now it should be noted when you first open your game, this will be empty. And so you're going to want to load it with your faction chips on the four on either side and then your gold opportunity chips here in the middle. Then we can go ahead and load our three decks. We have our bloodshed deck. We have our opportunity deck which is going to go right in the middle here. And then lastly, we're going to have our blue sport deck off to the side. So at this point during your first setup, this is actually a really good time to pick which hero you want to play. And I'll show you why as we go, but it's going to kind of inform your setup. So we're going to grab one of our trays and we're going to go in and we're actually, we're just going to take this chip right here and we're going to say that we are Kraken Lance. We'll just go ahead, we'll put him here. We'll come back to this tray in a minute. But this is important because now, first of all, we know he's the Atlantean hero. We're going to start in Atlantis, so we want the Atlantis mat. So you have four different double-sided mats, but we're going to go ahead and put out the Atlantis mat right here in the middle. So that is all set up. We also, knowing which hero we're playing with, that's going to tell us from this little deck of prowess cards which ones we want to set aside. So first we're going to take all the ones that say special prowess and you can set those above the mat and then find all the ones that match your hero. So in this case that have the image of Kraken Lance on them. Pull those ones out and we're also going to set those aside. You can take everything else in the deck and return them to the box. You're not going to need them for this game. So we've got our arena, we've got our prowess cards. Next we're going to go through our chip trays. So starting nice and simple, we can take our health chip trays. We're going to set that right up in the corner there and you can set the lid back in the box or off to the side. Then we're going to take this tray. This is going to have veins, arena units, and tactics in it. And we'll return to those in a little bit for more information, but those are going to go up here on the left. And again, you can set the lid off to the side or back in the box. So at this point, we can do Primus Selection. For Primus Selection, you're going to take your bag and you're going to take all of the remaining thick chip heroes that you did not use, plop them in the bag, shake them up, and you're going to want three. Doesn't matter what order you grab them in, so you can go ahead in this instance and grab all three at once. So we have the Parthian, we have Nox, and we have Bingsheng. So these are going to be the three Primuses that we have to face on our way to Mount Vesuvius. And those are going to slot right in here, just like so. You can dump the rest out. They're going to return to that tray that I have off screen and they're not going to be used in this game. And we'll go ahead, we'll set the bag over here off to the side for now. So now let's actually finalize our hero setup. So to do that, we're going to need two things. First, we're going to need the manual and we'll flip to the end, page 38 to 39. And then we're going to want this little hero tracker pad. So this is going to basically represent your hero through the whole game, how their stats grow and change and certain other elements that we'll get to later. So first things first, we can write down our hero's name just so we remember who we're playing as. And then on this page of the manual, it's going to show us a breakdown of all the different heroes and how they start. So from the left, it's going to tell us we have two movement. That's the green icon. We have a range of one. We start with five hit points. So we'll go ahead, we'll mark off five of those hearts, and we will actually right away give our hero all five red health chips that they will begin the game with and set them there. It's going to tell us what we start with for attack dice. So over here, you'll notice you have four 
attack dice in columns. And this represents how they upgrade from yellow to blue to green to black as they get progressively better. So in this instance, Kraken Lance starts with two blue. So you can take the first two columns, cross out the yellows, because we just skipped those entirely, and circle the blue ones to represent what Kraken Lance begins the game with. You'll notice Kraken Lance has two dice that can continue to be upgraded, but also two additional columns where, as the game goes, he can add additional dice if you choose to develop him in that way. So he is a tactician class, so we'll just circle this just so we don't forget because that comes into play, and a leadership one, two, three, four, and five, and that represents how many units he gets to have in his camp, including himself. Tells us his home region and home arena, which we already know, that's the Atlanteans. And then it's going to tell you what neutral units he begins the game with. So the neutral units, as I mentioned before, are over in this tray. So we can grab this whole stack, and it's going to tell you that he begins the game with an attacker, an archer, and a defender. So you can just scroll through, and that's actually their names. So the archer will say archer on it. So we have an archer, we have a defender, and we have an attacker. Once you have those, you can actually take the remaining neutral units and just make sure that that's what you have and nothing else. And those units are actually going to go in the bag, as we talked about earlier, and this is going to be your starting foes. These are the units that you're going to fight as you begin your journey. So not too hard, not too unpredictable, pretty easy, but it's going to get harder as you go. Lastly, it's going to tell you tactics. You begin with a full set of three tactics, which is the most you can hold without certain upgrades. So we'll go ahead, we'll move this up here where it can live most of the time, and we're going to grab ourselves an adrenaline, a hamstring, and a stun from this little column of chips up here. So we want a hamstring, we want a stun, and we want an adrenaline. And then we can take the rest of these tactics and put them right back there because we're going to need them as we go. So we're done with this for now. We can set that off to the side where we will grab it later. So now is a good time to pick which scion you want to fight, and that's going to be your ultimate endgame boss. Now bear in mind you may not make it there through the course of the game, but it helps to know who you're planning on facing so you can build your hero and build your squad accordingly. So we'll go ahead, we'll grab that last tray again. We have a whole stack of scions, and we can just flip through and decide who we feel like fighting today. In this case, we're going to go with Tautie, this monstrosity of a beast. And Tautie can slot in that final slot there, and you have your whole game mapped out in front of you. Now, before we get rid of this last tray here, we're going to need one more thing from it. So you want to find your reference card for the Scion, and you'll notice right here it's going to give you the name of a specific chip. So the red Scion Bane chip for Tautie is called Gigantic. And I'll explain what that means. Scion Banes are chips that come into the game and mess you up, or I should say Banes specifically. The Scion Bane is going to be the very first one that you encounter through the course of the game. So they all have different flavors that are going to change the game as you go. So we're going to find Gigantic, and over in this left tray where we have all of the other non-Scion Banes, we're going to take this red Bane specific to Tautie and slot it right at the front. So we know what that first one is going to be. That's all we need from this tray, so you can put this one back in the box. You're not going to need it for now. And now, feel free to study this card, to read through it at the beginning of the game, so that you have some familiarity with the Scion that you're going to face, and kind of know what you're getting into at that point. However, for now, you really don't need this in play, so once you're ready, you can set this off to the side, and the last piece we need here is going to be your region card. So we're in Atlantis. As soon as we start taking events in Atlantis, we're going to want to know how this arena functions. So you can find the Atlanteans reference sheet and just place it over here. As soon as we move arenas, the arena will shift and the reference card will shift. But for right now, this is what we need. So we can get rid of that final chip tray. And now the last step of setup is going to be choosing the difficulty we want to play at. So once again, we're going to grab the manual. And this time we're going to go to page 9. So there are three different difficulties you can choose. There is Chosen, which is going to be the easiest difficulty, and I recommend beginning the game there. Because it is far from easy, but it is a good way to introduce yourself to the mechanics and kind of ensure that you get through a lot, if not a complete game, without too much threat of getting knocked out early. 
There is Valiant, which is right in the middle, a good step up. And then there is Fearless, which I definitely don't recommend until you've been through the game quite a bit. So in this case, just for setup purposes, we're going to choose Valiant. And Valiant is going to do a couple of things. So first of all, you may have noticed on our tracker pad, there is this little stat here marked Blessings. So Blessings are an extra bonus that we'll get to in a little bit but you're gonna start with a different number of those depending on the difficulty you chose. So in this case, since we are playing on Valiant, we know that we're gonna start with four blessings. So we're gonna go ahead and we're actually going to circle those because they are a consumable resource. As we use them, we will cross off the ones that we have circled. So the circles are telling us we have four, but we may end up spending those as we go. So we have those, and then also on Valiant, we get to choose one of our stats to upgrade. So if we want, we can upgrade our health, our leadership, or our attack. Upgrading attack means either improving a die, so I could take a blue and make it a green, or adding a new die if you have some available. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's get a third die in the mix. We're just going to circle this yellow one here. So that is our starting game stats. And then on Valiant, we also get to choose a starting prowess card. So at the easiest difficulty, you get a few more. At the hardest difficulty, you don't get any, but on Valiant, you are going to get to choose one of Kraken Lance's prowess cards to begin the game with. So we're just gonna flip through those real quick. You can read through them, find what you like. When you play on this difficulty, I highly recommend Follow My Lead as the first prowess card you get. It gives him some very important skills that uh, are really going to help these early game fights. So it gives him Tactical and Inspire, both of which do very valuable things in combat. So. You can put that in this little column over here on the right, and that's where you're gonna house all of your prowesses as you earn them. Worth noting, there is no limit on how many you get other than how many can you earn through the course of the game. Getting new prowesses is not easy. It's gonna be hard work, so if you get a bunch of them, you've definitely earned it. You may end up stacking them or rearranging them however you feel is best. And now, on to overland movement. So at the beginning of each turn, you're going to have your overland movement phase. And there are a few different things that can happen here, so we're gonna cover those before we get into combat and the bulk of the game. So if you look down here, we've got our little party tracker. And at the beginning of the game, it's going to begin in your home region, in this case, the Atlanteans region, on your capital location. And the capital location is the one location in each region that has a little building. And we'll come back to what that is later on, but that is where you begin the game. So you're starting off in your hometown. And on each turn, you have to move. And you can move, you can travel via these dotted lines. So from this region, I can either go left to here or right over to here. And each of these icons that you see is going to mean something a little bit different. So for example, if I went left up here to this blue icon, that is the sport location. So at the sport location, I would then choose to either accept or skip, which is a spectate, and we'll talk more about that a little later on, but I would choose to accept, let's say, the top sport event of the sport deck. And these are facing you the entire time, so you can look at these and get information and know what you're headed towards. So blue is going to be these sport events. If I continue on this path, we get a red bloodshed event. Similar deal, I would take the top card from the red bloodshed deck, and that would be my event in this location. Each time you move and accept one of these, you would be crossing off a week on your little tracker sheet, getting closer and closer to the end of the act. And bear in mind, you have exactly 12 weeks to reach that primus. So if you find yourself falling short, you've taken a bad path, there are ways you can get there. It's not gonna cost you the game, but it's gonna cost you in other ways. So as you map out your path, you wanna keep your time in mind. So that is bloodshed, that is sport. These little green locations here, these are opportunities. These still cost you a week, but you're not gonna take a combat. When you reach an opportunity location, you will actually draw the top two cards of the opportunity deck. You'll look at them. You'll choose which one you wanna take and set over in the opportunity area of your camp, and you'll discard the other one to the back of the deck. And what opportunities provide is a chance to buff up your squad in different ways. It basically gives you a different scenario, something you have to accomplish. You can think of it basically as a side quest. In this case, I took Reckless. And Reckless says, add a bag unit to the end of the rival lineup in a bloodshed event and win the event. 
That'll make more sense when we get to bloodshed, but basically what that means is I can choose to add an extra unit to the opposing team. I can make them a little bit stronger when I'm fighting a bloodshed event, and if I win the event, I achieve this opportunity. Now these are optional. I can take this card and it can sit in my camp. I do not have to add a bag unit at any point. I can choose to at the start if I want to try and achieve this opportunity. And if I achieve this opportunity, I immediately gain, in this case, a hero prowess. So often they'll give you hero prowess. Sometimes they'll let you remove banes from the game. And sometimes they'll give you access to special units and special tactics called opportunity units and opportunity tactics that are in the middle of your tray here. And these are unique units and tactics you can't earn in any other way. They're very special, they're very powerful, and achieving opportunities is the only way you can get those. So opportunities, while they cost you a week and don't give you anything immediate, can be very powerful in the long run. And this game is all about the long run. So those are the three main types of events that you will see. You'll also notice these little ship icons. These are your harbors. And there are one, two, three, four of these across the entire map. And basically there are two ways of treating these. One, you can ignore them. So say you're here on this sport event and you wanna go down to a Lamotion arena and take a sport event down there. You can just go right over that ship icon and pretend it's not even there. So doesn't exist, you're just going from one sport to another, marking off a week as normal. However, if you find yourself in a position like I mentioned earlier, where you have to cover a lot of ground quickly because you planned poorly, you can go to this harbor, cross off a week, so this does cost you time, and then actually go to another harbor, and from there, take another event. So it lets you cross large sections of map at the cost of a single week. It's not always ideal, but it is a way to bail yourself out of some tight situations. So that is what these little harbors are going to do for you. And remember, you can skip them, going right over them, or you can choose to use them. The last thing that you can do as you travel, instead of accepting any events or anything we've talked about before, is spectating. So when you choose to spectate, it's going to do a few things all at once. The first is wherever you're going. So let's say we took our party tracker and we went to what would be a bloodshed region. So a bloodshed event. We're gonna go ahead, we're gonna take our deck, and the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna discard this top event to the back. So basically we're looking at it going, I don't think we can take this. Let's just go ahead, let's cycle it, let's get rid of it. I don't wanna have to deal with that. Secondly, you get to take the top three cards of any deck. And for simplicity's sake, we'll just take this one. You get to look at those cards, and you get to rearrange them in any order you want. Now, you can't discard them, but you get to choose what you think you can take next in what order you want to face them, put them back, and then you can put this deck back in its spot. So when you spectate, it gives you a little bit more agency over the next couple events that you're going to see in a given deck. Next, you're going to gain Scion influence. So this is the big downside of choosing to spectate. So on your little tracker pad, down here at the bottom, you're gonna see the Scion Influence track. And as that ticks up, Banes, which we touched on earlier, are going to get added to the bag that houses the enemy units, or in some cases, they'll get added to your camp. In either way, they're going to pop up and they're going to screw with you and get in your way and give you negative effects. So when you spectate, you're going to gain Scion Influence. The amount you gain depends on the act you're in. So if we were in Act 1, we would just gain one Scion influence, and we would just mark that off as so. However, let's jump ahead. Say we're in Act 4, and this is what our tracker pad looks like. We spectate, we're going to gain four Scion influence. One, two, three, four. And you'll notice we crossed off one of these little Scion icons. The moment we do that, we draw the top Bane from the Bane stack. We read it and it'll tell us if it goes in the bag or in our camp. In this case, it is a bag bane. So we're gonna find our bag, we're gonna plop it in there, and it'll pop up to mess with us later on. Now, you may be saying to yourself, this seems like a horrible deal, why am I spectating? Well, that's because it's how you heal as well. The final step is you take your hero and whatever damage they're at, and you get to heal them all the way back up to full health. This is important because when your hero dies, that's uh, it's not a good thing. That is going to cost you the game sometimes. So as your hero takes damage through these various fights, that is permanent. Spectating is one of the most reliable and consistent ways to get that health back 
when you absolutely need it. And lastly, I talked about these capital locations. You, other than at the beginning of the game where you begin on one, you are not allowed to go across them or into those except in one situation. At the end of each act, you are going to face a rival Primus. And you can take that Primus early. So, at the beginning of the game, there are three capital locations you are allowed to enter. Right now, we have the Parthian from Parthia, we have Bingxing from Kunlun, and we have Nox from Vesuvius. So in those three regions, we are allowed to enter the capital, but doing so immediately triggers a Primus fight, which is the end of the act, win or lose, um, very difficult challenge, so you want to make sure you're ready. But if you are ready, you can enter the capital location on those three regions. Similarly, in Vesuvius, if you are in the fourth act of the game, you can enter the capital location there as well to take the Scion fight when you're ready. Outside of that, you are not allowed to enter or pass over those locations. They are barred from you, they are impassable. If those Primuses are not on your to kill list, you're not allowed to go there. Similarly, if you've already been there and defeated that Primus, you're not allowed to go back there. So those are basically off limits from you. So as you travel, you'll notice we've got all these little regions, and each region is going to have their own flavor, and that's what we're gonna get into right now. So as you cross the borders into other regions, you're going to change the arena you fight in and the rules that you fight with. So as we move from Atlantis over here to the Lamotion region, we're actually going to find the Lamotion arena and the Lamotion reference card. And they are structured in such a way that they're often paired next to where they are, so you have to switch these out with the ones you have set aside as little as possible. And so each arena is going to have its unique architecture, a unique layout. The arena hexes are going to be in unique locations, as well as the spawning hexes for you and your opponents. And then, of course, it's going to have its own unique rule set. So in this case, it is a mountainous region where the closer to the middle you are, the higher you climb. And if you're higher than the units you're attacking, you get to hit them for more damage, or you get to roll more attack dice against them. So every time you reach a new region, be sure and take a moment to familiarize yourself with that region and how it works. The last aspect of regions that is worth noting is that every region has a local talent. So those are going to be marked in blue over here on these reference sheets. And those give local units, so units that are from this region, bonuses within that region. So if we were to have a Lamotion unit come out, once they're in play, they're going to get a bonus. So in this case, local units always have extra movement. They get to climb the hill faster, which is going to put them at an advantage over you. But again, every arena is going to have different local skills. So be sure and pay attention to those when you're weighing what events to take and how those events are going to play out. So before we really dive into combat and the nitty gritty of how it's gonna play out, I wanna go through a few of the important building blocks that are gonna help you understand what's happening and also play the rival's turn for the rival. Since this is a solo game, you will be guiding their units. Most of the decisions will be made for you, but you will be in charge of carrying those out. So let's start with taking a look at a unit and kind of what a unit looks like. So you'll notice, and we'll pull one of these up on the screen for you, I have the Fury. So the green number at the top is gonna to be movement. That's gonna tell you when this unit moves, how many hexes it can move on the map. So you're gonna see typically a range of one, two, or in some cases, three. The quickest units in the game will often move three. The orange number right below that is gonna be that unit's range. And that is telling you when this unit attacks, that is how close or how far away it can attack an opposing unit. So often you'll see a one, that means it has to be right next to another unit to attack it. A two would be two hexes away, and if you should happen to have a unit with a range of three, that can hit a unit three hexes away. Below that is the unit's hit points, so that is gonna be how many health chips you put under it when it enters play. Obviously your hero is a little different, we've talked about that separately. Then right in the middle you're gonna see some dice, and that's gonna vary from a single die to sometimes three or four in the case of the strongest units. They're different colors, and that is basically telling you that unit's attack. So down here we have a cataphract that has a black and a blue. So when that unit attacks an opposing unit, you would find a black die and a blue die, 
and you would roll those dice, and the different colors have different probabilities of hitting. So as you play the game, you'll learn to go, oh, red is the best. Red always hits. Black is really good. Green is 50-50. Or no, actually, green is four out of six, so pretty good. Blue is 50-50, and yellow is pretty terrible. Down at the bottom, you're going to have your skills. And your skills are going to come into play in various ways throughout combat. And there are three different types that I want to draw your attention to. There is the I skills. They are green, the I stands for innate, and innate skills typically are always active. They're something that is going on in the background and either gives you a special ability all the time or is going to trigger under certain effects. So in this example, we have a defender who has the innate skill taunt. Taunt means when a unit is next to it, if it's an opposing unit, that unit has to attack an enemy with taunt. So that lets my defender get in there and soak up hits for other units. Another very common one you'll see is the innate retaliate, which means when this unit takes attack damage, if it survives, it deals one damage back to that attacker if they are within that printed range that we talked about earlier. So there are lots of innates, and you want to make sure you internalize them and just kind of remember. Again, there's not too many. You'll memorize them very quickly, and so you know at a glance what's going on on the board. The A skills, which stands for abilities, are a little bit simpler, and you only have to remember them at a certain step in combat, which we'll get to later. So abilities happen right in the middle, after you move and before you start your engagement step, which is attacking and special skills, which we'll get to in a second. And abilities have very specific triggers. They're going to tell you, oh, you moved here. Uh, for example, this cataphract also has an A ability called Fury Aura. So Fury Aura, and I'm going to grab my little skills reference sheet here. So Fury Aura says, this unit deals one damage to an opponent within number of hexes. So this says Fury Aura 1. So after it moves, one, two, Fury Aura can trigger dealing a damage to a unit within one hex. So it could deal one damage to this defender before it even attacks. So it's just a little bonus damage. It doesn't trigger stuff like retaliate because it's not an attack. It's a pretty good little ability. And while we're looking at this unit skills list, another important element to it, it is not only going to define all of your skills, your innates, your abilities, and your specials, but when it's relevant in italics below the definition, it's going to tell you when and how the rival is going to use that skill. So for example, in the case of Fury Aura, which we just triggered, it's going to say triggers if it would deal damage to an opponent. So it's always going to use this if possible, but it also says this unit uses Fury Aura on the weakest opponent possible. That is, the opponent that has the lowest health. So it's basically telling you in a situation like this, if the Cataphract moved in between these two units, it would want to use that ability to deal damage to the one that's closer to dying. It wants to knock my units out. And this is also an interesting situation because they're also sandwiched by a defender that has taunt. So you'd want to grab your skills list and see exactly how it's written and see, is it going to pull Fury Aura away? So let's look at taunt. Taunt says, when an opponent adjacent to the unit attacks, it must attack a unit that has taunt. So Fury Aura gets around that. It doesn't have to use Fury Aura on my defender, so it can hit this unit and get it one step closer to death. So that's a little bit about abilities. Again, you'll want to get used to these on your skills reference sheet and start knowing what to look for and what they mean at a glance, which happens pretty quickly. The third type of skill is called a special, and it's marked with an S, and it appears in kind of a light purple there. A special happens during the last step of combat, and basically it replaces your attack. During this final step, which is called the engagement step, and we'll get to in, in a little more depth later on, during this step, your units can either attack if they want to attack, or use a special if they have a special on them. Specials are usually kind of different sorts of attacks or you know, special attacks, but some kind, sometimes they're gonna do non-damage effects as well. So basically you're looking going, okay, do I have a special I wanna use? Is it better than my attack? Does it do something specific? In this case, we have this unit called the Fury, and they have a special called Agile. Now Agile is a very interesting one. Let's read it real quick. So Agile, special, says this unit rolls dice equal to its attack and deals the rolled damage to its target. And you may be saying to yourself, well, that sounds exactly like an attack. Why would you use it? Well, we just saw a really interesting situation earlier where not doing 
an attack. We're doing damage outside of an attack, in this case with an ability, is important. And the special agile functions the same way. If you were adjacent to a unit with taunt, you could just use agile and hit whatever unit you want because agile is not an attack. So agile is a special that deals damage similar to an attack, but does so in a unique way that is going to skirt around certain other innates that uh, might deal you damage back or you know, have other negative effects. So that's an important one to keep an eye on. And there are a few other specials sprinkled throughout that you'll get to discover on your own. So those are kind of the building blocks of units and all the things you're going to see and experience on them. The last element that comes into play in little bits is the icon on the right side of the chip. And that's going to tell you what class that unit is. You'll have defenders, you'll have tacticians, you'll have archers, you'll have attackers. And in one arena, you'll even see some beasts. But uh, in this game, you won't get any beasts into your camp. Um, and those are going to come into play with tactics and a few other effects. Uh, but right now, we don't need to get into any of that. Now, the last thing that I want to go over before we dive into some full battle examples is priorities. And priorities are probably the most complicated at first element of this game. So we're going to take a minute to really dig into an example so that hopefully when we get to battles and talk about them a little more and you see them in action, uh, you'll have an understanding of what exactly is going on. Because I'm not going to get into too much detail there, which is why we're covering it here. So every arena has their reference sheet, which we've already seen. And at the bottom of that reference sheet is a line or sometimes multiple lines of priorities. And priorities are basically the guide for rival units. Those priorities are telling the rival units where they want to go and who they want to attack at different times. So, for example, we have the Parthian arena up, and it only has a single priority line. So this one's nice and simple. Every single rival unit in play is going to follow this single line of priorities. Certain arenas will have multiple lines for different unit types or a different line for the you know, enemy primus, things like that. In this case, the Parthian line says, all units will first flag holder, second opponent on chariot, third unoccupied chariot, fourth hero, and fifth strongest opponent. Those are the order in which they want to reach and in some cases attack things. So the priority list will come into play in two different steps once we reach combat. The first step is movement. During movement, rival units are going to mark. That is, they're going to check the priorities list and see either what the highest priority they can reach is or just what the highest priority in play is. So during the rival movement step, we've got an example set up and we're going to get into it. We have two cataphracts in play. They have movement of two, and movement is always important during the marking step because they're always looking for what they can reach. If they have their top priority out of reach, but a lower priority within reach, they'll go to the lower priority. They're not going to waste their turn. Uh, we've tried to make them as intelligent as possible. So in this case, you can move them in any order. That is where your agency as a player comes in a little bit. You can decide which of these you want to move first. So I think we're going to move this cataphract here. He has a movement of two, so he can get two hexes away on this map, which really gives him a lot of range. He can reach pretty much any unit. But we're going to jump over to the priorities list and see what he wants to go to. So first of all, we see in bold, flag holder. That is saying that if the flag holder is in play, so if any of my units are in play and it is a capture the flag event, this unit wants to reach them in such a way that he can attack them. So a bold priority says, this is a priority you are going to want to attack in a later step. So it basically says you want to get within your range. Now this unit's range is one, so if there was a flag holder, he would be looking to be next to that unit. In this case, there is no flag holder in play, so we're just going to jump right to the next priority. The next priority, which is also bold, is opponent on chariot. So you'll notice there is this chip right here, and this is the chariot chip of this arena. It is kind of the unique flavor for this arena. It's going to move around in a circle. Units can ride on it. There are you know, some special bonuses for being on there in certain scenarios. And basically, he's looking, and he wants to see if I have a unit on there. And if I have a unit on there, that's who he's going to want to attack. Because remember, this one is in bold. That means I want to attack this priority later on. So he would want to be next to it. But you'll see this arena chip is sitting here empty. I don't have a unit on it, so he's also going to skip that priority. Next, and this one's not in bold, is an unoccupied chariot. So a not in bold priority 
is only used during marking because it can never be attacked. Not bold priorities basically say to the rival, this is something you want to reach. You want your unit on this location and you won't worry about it when you get to the uh, engage step where you're attacking things. It basically just says, go here. So we have an unbold occupied chariot or unoccupied chariot. And you'll notice that unoccupied chariot is well within this unit's movement of two. So because we have reached a priority during marking that we can reach, we're not going to continue to go down this list. This is the highest priority right now, and we can reach it. So we're going to go ahead, move this unit on here, and that unit's movement is done. It reached its priority. It's perfectly happy. We'll circle back to this unit when we get to the targeting step in just a minute. So that leaves this other cataphract down here. Now, we're going to jump back to the priorities and go through them a little more quickly now that you have some understanding. So flag holder, we know they're not in play. Opponent on a chariot, nope, they have an ally on the chariot, but not an opponent, so they can skip that one. Unoccupied chariot, it was, but now it's occupied, so we can skip that one. Now we reach the hero. So their next priority in bold is the hero. They want to get to my hero in such a way that they can attack him. He has a movement of two and a range of one, which means at best he could get over here or here, which is too far away to attack my hero. So he knows my hero is in play, but because he can't actually reach him in the way he wants to, remember, in bold means he wants to be able to attack him, he's going to take a look at the next priority and see if he can reach that. So we're going to jump to the final priority on this list, the bold priority strongest opponent. So strongest is just referencing their hit points. How many hit points do they have? So he is looking, and he can actually reach two of my units. Both my other units in play other than my hero, this unit can get to. So one, two, one, two, or even one, two can reach any of them. However, they have different hit points. The defender has five, while the fury has two. So the defender is the strongest opponent and is reachable, so that is the unit that this cataphract wants to go towards. Now, here's a little more player choice. I can decide whether I want to put the cataphract here or here. They are both equidistant. They both satisfy the requirements. So I can choose, do I want the cataphract farther from my fury, farther from my hero, or a little closer? In this case, I don't see a huge tactical advantage one way or another. So I'm going to go ahead and put the cataphract here next to the defender, but a little closer to my fury so I can get in and attack it sooner rather than later. Now, we touched on Fury Aura briefly, so just for accuracy's sake, as we pass through the ability step that I'll talk about when we get into battle, they're going to hit this defender for one hit point of damage. But now we would enter the engage step, and in the engage step, they're looking to attack or potentially use specials if they have them. Neither of these do. So they're looking at their attacks, and for attacks, we're going right back to those priorities list, and they're going to use them in a very similar way. When attacking, when targeting, you can skip the non-bold priorities. They basically don't exist. They're not trying to attack non-bold priorities because those are locations on the map uh, that make no sense for them to attack. So they're just looking to deal damage. So they're basically, both of them are looking to see, hey, is there a flag holder in play? There's not. Opponent on chariot. Nope, we know that. Unoccupied, we can skip. Hero. Well, we already know the hero is out of range. This one cannot reach the hero. This one cannot reach the hero. So ultimately, they're both looking at the strongest opponent. This one has a range of one, so he can't attack anybody. So we're really happy that he jumped on the chariot because basically he sort of wasted his turn. Maybe he clogged up the chariot if that's somewhere we wanted to go, which is possible. But right now, he's at least not dealing us damage. This cataphract, on the other hand, is within one of the defender. The defender is not only the strongest unit, it's the only unit. So that is the unit that this cataphract would attack. So that's a little bit of a deeper dive on the priorities so that as we get into combat and start going through some examples, you understand what I'm doing because I'm not going to talk about it too much at length. So with that in mind, let's jump into some combat examples. So starting off, we're down here and we're going to slide up to a bloodshed region. So we're going to take a bloodshed event and we already know we're going to accept this event. We're going to do this. So we're going to mark off a week over here and draw 
this bloodshed event. Now, remember, these are face forward, so I know what I'm getting into here. That is an important aspect of this game, is paying attention to what's coming up and knowing whether you think you can beat an event or not. So we drew living regrets. So in this instance, when accepted, for each opportunity card in your camp, either deal your hero one damage, even though they're not even in play yet, or discard the opportunity card. So we've run around a little bit and we have an opportunity card down here. And the opportunity cards, as you'll remember, are our little side quests, how we can get stronger outside of combat. And I want to hang on to this. I think it's important and I just have one. So I'm going to go ahead and start right off the bat by dealing one damage to Crack and Lance. So off to a bumpy start, but that's okay. Now we're going to set the rival lineup. So over here on the left in the blue, we have the rival lineup and it shows us how many units they have and whether or not they come with tactics. So starting at the top, we have an L. That means a local unit. So we're in the Atlantis region. We're going to take the top Atlantis chip of that stack and we're going to put it right here as the first rival unit to deploy. And you'll notice it also has a little T. That indicates that this unit is bringing a tactic with it to battle. So in this case, we're going to check our reference guide on the back of the manual. This is a tactician and it tells us that tactician brings the tactic hamstring. So we're going to go ahead, we're going to find that tactic and slot it in right next to that tactician. Nextly, we have just the generic unit icon. What that means is they're going to bring in a random unit from the bag. So we can grab the bag, we can look around and we can just grab, what did we get? We got a defender. So we know that we're going to face the Atlantean Retiarius and this defender and they're going to bring a hamstring with them. Over on the right hand side, it's telling us information about our lineup. In this case, we see an H, that means our hero can enter combat. And we see three generic units, that means three other units from our camp can also enter combat. Unlike the rival, we can deploy those units in any order. And we can even choose to hold our hero back if we think we can get the job done with just three basic units. But remember, these bloodshed events are lethal. If I lose my units in this fight, I don't get them back. So that's something you want to weigh as you're going into this fight. So once you're set with this, you can put it down here as a reminder. Some events will have ongoing effects, things that are going to impact battle as you go. In this case, it was just a one-off at the start, so we really don't have to think about it anymore. Next, you want to make sure your arena is set up. So the Atlantis Arena actually has a trident chip that sits in the middle. Now your reference card will tell you everything you need to know about how this works, but the short rundown is units that enter that space will pick the trident chip up and then your units have the choice. You get to decide if you want to throw that trident at any other unit in play and deal them a certain amount of damage. Rival units will do the same thing. The only difference is when they pick it up, they are absolutely going to throw it at your units. Now again, the nitty gritty of this is on the card. So you're going to want to go through this and get familiar with it. So we've got our trident out, we have our arena reference here, the rival lineup is set, and it is time to dive in. So there are a few different steps to each turn in combat, and the rival is always going to go first. Going first, they're going to take their first unit, they're going to deploy them. So they deploy with their printed health. So in this instance, they have three health, and be sure you're giving them blue health chips so you can differentiate them from you. So you'll notice the rival deployment hexes, these scary looking ones with the crown and the skull icon, are all numbered one, two, three. When the rival deploys a unit, they're going to deploy it to the lowest available number. So in this case, the Retiarius comes out on deployment hex one. Following the deployment, they're going to try and play a tactic. Now, tactics have some specific rules. Typically, they can only be played on your own units or adjacent enemies. And every tactic is going to be either a beneficial tactic that you play on yourself or a detrimental tactic that you play on the opposing units. They're going to check and they're going to look and see that, oh, hamstring is a detrimental tactic. They want to play it on my units. I don't even have any units in play, so they couldn't do that. If I did have a unit in play, typically it would have to be adjacent. But in this case, the Retiarius has the tactical skill part of which means it can play tactics and the rival can play tactics on units regardless of where they are in play. You no longer need adjacency. So the next step is going to be movement. And typically when units enter the arena, they enter dazed. So a unit comes into play and it can't move and it also cannot attack. Uh, in this case, 
Again, this unit has tactical. The double bonus of tactical, apart from being able to play tactics without range restrictions, is that unit can actually move the turn it comes into play. It cannot attack, but it is free to move. So this is where we're going to jump over to our arena sheet, and that's going to tell us where units want to move, and also, when we get there, how they want to attack. So from left to right, I'll just read this off. We have flag holder, unequipped trident, a potent with the trident, and farthest opponent. So this unit is basically looking at this list, trying to decide, first of all, what is even in play, but most importantly, of what's in play, what can I reach? So it's looking from left to right, trying to find these items, and then measuring, can I reach them? So starting with the flag holder, it doesn't even exist. There is no flag in play, so there's no flag holder in play, so we can just skip that one. The second one is the unequipped trident. Now that is in play, and because it is in play, and within this unit's movement of three, we're not even going to look at the other items on this list. This unit is going to see the trident, it's going to see that it can reach the trident, and it's going to go ahead and stop the marking process there and take its move. So in this case, the unit is going to move one, two, to its mark, and because of the arena rules, it's going to automatically pick up this trident. Following this is the abilities step. For this, you're going to want to reference your full reference sheet. This is going to give you the details of what every skill does, as well as, in italics, how the rival uses it and when the rival uses it. So in this case, the Retiarius has the ability Hook. Hook is going to let it hook other units and draw them closer. Now there are two things at play here. One, there are no other units on the field, so it just couldn't use this no matter what. Secondly, despite the fact that it moved, it is technically still dazed, so it would not be able to trigger hook even if there were other units in play. The last step is the engage step. During the engage step, units are going to attack opposing units, or if they have special abilities, then those are going to be marked with an S, they may choose to trigger those special abilities. And again, this will be outlined on the skills reference sheet in italics under what circumstances the rival chooses to trigger those specials. That is the whole rundown of the rival turn, and then it switches back over to you and it becomes your turn. And you have roughly the same steps. You are going to deploy a unit, uh, you are going to play tactics if you wish to play tactics, you will move, you will trigger abilities, and you will have your own engage step. And similarly, your units will enter dazed. So looking at this board, you know that this unit wants to throw the trident at you. So we're going to bring in a big chunky defender because we really don't want our hero taking that hit. So we're going to bring out our defender. We're going to give him one, two, three, four, five hit points. And we don't really have anything else to do. He can't move because he's dazed. He has nobody to attack, and he's also dazed. We don't have any tactics that we want to play on him. There's nobody adjacent to him to play a tactic. So our turn is basically going to be over, and we're going to switch back over to the rival. So you'll notice combats pick up a little slow, and then they start to escalate. But we're going to loop back over, and again, the first thing they're going to do is deploy. So they have a defender of their own. So one, two, three, four, five health chips. Because the Retiarius moved, the one spot is available again, so they're going to deploy there. Now it's their tactic step. They do have a tactic to play, so they have the hamstring. This would go on an opposing unit, of which there is my defender. And because the Retiarius has the tactical skill, that means this can be placed on my unit at range, and that is exactly what they're going to do. So they're going to slap this on my unit, and the hamstring tactic reads, this unit cannot attack on a turn it uses its movement. So basically, this guy can either move or attack, but not both. So it's a very limiting sort of a thing that I'm not happy about at all. But it actually, there's a silver lining that you'll see in a moment. So now we're going to move on to movement. I already know this defender can't move because he's dazed. So the only unit that would move is the Retiarius. Now, the Retiarius is going to check their marking stats again. So these priorities, there's no flag holder still. There's no unequipped trident because we're already holding the trident. Opponent with a trident, nope, our opponent doesn't, and the farthest opponent away. So we know that this is the farthest unit away. So we want to get within range of that opponent. Our range is one, so we want to be right up next to him. 
since he has one, he has to be adjacent to attack somebody, so he's going to go ahead and move right here. Now, we have the ability step. He could hook, but this guy is already adjacent, and hook is only within two hexes, so he can't even hook and draw his own character a little closer. So we're going to move past the ability step, and we're going to jump straight to the engage step. Now, the engage step, this unit would attack my defender, and they would attack with a single red die. However, they are holding the trident. And if you go back to your arena reference sheet, you will know that any rival unit holding the trident wants to use it. So they want to perform the special, in this case it's like an attack, the trident throw. This unit deals two damage to any opponent in combat. This unit must then unequip the trident and place it under them, so basically he is throwing the trident at my unit to deal them two damage, but it gets even worse. Strength of the sea is the local skill. Local units deal plus one damage when they use the special trident throw. So because the Retiarius is a local unit, he's going to throw this trident at my defender and deal one, two, three damage, and then luckily my defender will pick that trident right up. So there is a pro, there is a con, I now have the trident and that might come in handy on my turn. But the defender is hurting a little bit. So now it's going to switch back to me and I get to decide who I want to bring into play and I actually think I'm going to bring in this archer. This archer, oh actually, you know what, let's bring in a slightly better archer. Let's bring in the harpoonsman who is also a local unit. They only have two health, but what they have that I like is the innate ability first strike. First strike, if you check your skills reference, tells you that that unit can attack the turn it comes into play. And that's important because I want to get to some attacks before we move on and look at some sport events. So I'm going to bring in the harpoonsman, and do I want to play any tactics? I think I can kill this Retiarius this turn. I think I can do that, so I don't think I need to play a tactic. Now, tactics, once you spend them, they're not going to come back at the end of combat. You have to re-earn them by winning sport events. So these are an important resource that you don't want to spend too freely. They can really swing battles. So you want to use them sparingly because then you'll have to go work to get them back. So I think I'm going to skip the tactic deployment step. I'm going to move straight to movement. I don't think I'm going to use my movement because my defender doesn't want to move because that will negate his ability to attack. And my harpoonsman just came into play. She's dazed. That means she cannot move and normally couldn't attack if it weren't for first strike. So we're going to jump all the way to the engage step. And I'm going to start with the Harpoonsman using the first strike ability, enabling her to attack. She has a range of three, but she's going to target the Retiarius who is right next to her. So when you perform a basic attack, you check the chip and it's going to show you which dice you want to use. So in this case, we see a green and a blue. So we can go ahead and grab those. And if you look very closely, you'll see the numbers of the hits written on there. So the green, says four, the blue says three. So if you struggle, if you're a little bit colorblind, you can check and make sure that you're grabbing the right dice. So we have a green and a blue, we're targeting the Retiarius, and we're just gonna roll and see how many hits we get. So in this case, we got one hit on green, no hits on blue, 50-50, but that's not a big deal because after dealing one damage to the Retiarius, they're at two health. And you've probably guessed what's gonna happen next. Our defender, who didn't move, is going to throw that trident right back. Trident comes in, he's non-local, so he only deals two damage, but that's all he needed. One, two, the Retiarius is dead. So the Retiarius is just going to go face down over here. The trident is going to sit where it landed, and both of our units have acted, so that is going to be the end of the engage step, and it's going to switch right back over. And things are pretty simple from here. Their defender is slow. They have nobody left to deploy. So the defender is looking, and he wants the unequipped trident because it is the closest thing to him. So he looks for the flag holder. He looks for the unequipped trident. Opponent with a trident, farthest opponent. He can't reach any of them. So he's just going to try and get to whatever is closest. So he's going to take one very slow step over here. So you've got a sense of how the bloodshed events work. 
Um, they're differing from sport events in a very key way, which is when your units die, you don't get them back, as I mentioned. So in this case, I would want to be very careful with these two units. The Harpoonsman only has two health. The Defender had five, only has two left. I would probably bring out my other units, even though I could win without it, but I have an allotment of four. I would bring the other two out so that I could make sure I got this Defender down before he managed to kill any of my units in play. So bloodshed events are very key in terms of manipulating how the combat goes so you don't lose units. You want to spread that damage around and do your best to win the event without losing units. After we win an event, which hopefully happens a lot, you can go ahead and clear the combat field. Remember, your hero keeps whatever health they have. So if they came into play, you return them with their stack of health or you throw it everywhere just like that. And then your other units are going to come off their health stacks and go here. You can return the health to the tray. Any tactics that were used are going to go back in the tactics tray. You can take this chip and you can either you can leave it here if you want or you can put it back in the tray in case you switch arenas. And then you're going to clean up. So clean up for a bloodshed event means any units that are defeated, so their units and any of mine that had been defeated, in this case none were, are going to go into the bag. And now you're going to earn your reward. For a bloodshed event, your reward is you get to upgrade one of your stats. You get to upgrade your health, you get to upgrade your leadership, or you get to upgrade your attack. And we want our hero to be big and strong. We're going to go ahead, cross out this blue, circle this green, and upgrade Kraken Lance's attack so that we're a little bit stronger going into the next event, which is probably a sport. So, Next up, we're going to look at sport events. And in the combat in sport events is going to play out exactly like the combat in bloodshed events. The difference is your goal is going to vary. You're not just trying to wipe the board and you know, kill all the opposing units. You actually have some very specific goals that you're trying to accomplish. So in this case, we've moved over to the Lemotion Arena, and we're going to draw the top card, and it is Winds of Change. So when accepted, you may discard an opportunity from your camp to add two camp units to your lineup. So we look at this and we see we only get two units. They get three. Uh, I don't like those odds. I picked up an extra opportunity. So I will go ahead and discard one of these to give myself a lineup of four. Now, you'll notice we've got three little icons up here at the top of this card. We have a flag, a hill with a crown on it, and some swords and a shield. Those are the three different sport event types. And the different cards will sometimes give you just one, sometimes two. In this case, it shows all three. That means we get to choose whether we want Capture the Flag, King of the Hill, or a sparring event. Now, before you make that choice, you probably want to know what those three different types mean. So, let's set this off to the side. First things first is Capture the Flag. And you probably can guess at it from the title, but let me show you how it works. There is a flag chip, and this flag chip is always going to begin on the rival deployment hex one. Now, the rival won't pick it up or do anything with it. However, your goal is to reach that flag. Any unit of yours that reaches it automatically picks it up and carries it with, and get that flag back to any of your deployment hexes. So you want to run across the map, grab the flag, get back. The moment your flag reaches your deployment hex, doesn't matter which one, you immediately win the event. However, you'll notice that all of the priorities for the rival put the flag holder first. So as soon as your unit picks up that flag, all the rival units are gunning for it. And the different maps are going to play out differently. You may look at this map and go, well, that's a really long ways to go. And there's not a lot of place to hide. I can't run around and avoid the enemy. They're going to be coming right for me. I probably don't want to do capture the flag on this particular arena. So let's look at the next one, King of the Hill. So every arena is going to have arena hexes, and you'll notice they share the icon with King of the Hill. They've got the little mountain with the crown on top. So in this instance, those are printed right on the mat. In certain arenas, like Atlantis, where we were earlier, it's actually on the trident chip. So units holding the trident are considered on the arena hex. So in this case, they're right in the middle, and for King of the Hill, when you have a unit on an arena hex, at the start of your turn, so before you even deploy, you actually gain a point. To measure those, you have a little d6, and you can just tick it up. So if I start the turn with my reptilian here, I gain one point. For King of the Hill, you simply want to earn six points. And in this case, there are two. 
So if I get two units on both of these spots, I'll actually get two points at a time at the start of my turn. However, again, as always, the enemy is just trying to beat me down. They're coming up, they're attacking me, they're trying to kill my units. So it's not as easy as it seems to just plop your units there. You might want to draw the enemy away and you know keep them off your back. So King of the Hill on this particular arena is a maybe. We'll think about it. The third and final type of sporting event is the spar. So sparring events are a lot like bloodshed in that you're trying to knock out most of the opposing units. The difference is, in sport events, the rival has a tribune. So the tribune is going to be applied to one of the rival units, and we'll get to how that works in a second. But the tribune is basically the local favorite. Everybody is paid to come out and see the tribune perform. The locals just absolutely love this fighter. And if you defeat the tribune, if you knock them out, no matter what, even if your hero is out of play, your hero is reduced to one health. Basically, the mob rushes the field and they attack you. They didn't. It's a sporting event. How dare you? So the Tribune is basically an almost untouchable unit. You can defeat them, but at a cost. And this is always going to be applied to a rival unit in a sport event. Now, in Capture the Flag and King of the Hill, it's navigated a little more easily. You don't need to defeat the opposing units to win the game. In a spar event, you need to defeat all the rival units except the Tribune. Basically, you need to knock out the Tribune's entire team. The wrinkle is the Tribune in a spar event is always going to come out first. In King of the Hill and Capture the Flag, you would set the enemy lineup, and then you would choose which unit you want to give the Tribune chip to. You would look and go, oh, this unit is pretty slow. I can avoid him pretty easily. Let's make him the Tribune. For a spar event, it's always the first unit out of the gate. And you know that that is typically going to be a local unit. They're going to be extra strong and extra deadly. So you might look at this and go, well, hmm, the Lamotion region, the local units move really fast. They get movement three. He's going to be right on top of me, and I don't want him to defeat him. I don't want that penalty. Ooh, this is a tough one for a sparring event. So with that in mind, you might decide, let's do King of the Hill. I think based on our squad, based on the rules that we've got for this event, and based on the Tribune, King of the Hill is going to be our best bet to win Winds of Change. All right, so I've gone ahead and set up this event and laid out the rival lineup. And the first thing I notice is that we have a defender, and defenders are pretty slow. It's not a local unit, so it doesn't get any extra movement. So I'm going to go ahead and take the Tribune chip and apply it to this defender. I don't mind if they stay alive while I try to accomplish my King of the Hill goals. So they're going to take their first turn. They're going to go ahead and deploy the Demacharius, which is four health right here. They are dazed, so they're not going to move. They're not going to attack. They will, however, place this Adrenaline Tactic. The Adrenaline Tactic gives that unit an extra movement. And because it's played on themselves, they don't need any range to play it. So this unit now has three movement, which I am OK with. They're local. The local Mountaineer's ability would have given them three movement anyway, so that is fine by me. Now, knowing that sport events are a little bit more forgiving than bloodsheds, my units can die, and really they're just knocked out. If they get knocked out of a sport event, they'll be fine at the end of the day. I just don't want my hero to die. With that in mind, I can play a little bit more aggressively than I might in a bloodshed event. So in this case, I'm going to bring in my Demacharius. I earned one a little bit earlier. It's a really good unit on this map. I think I can do good things with it. So I'm going to go ahead, one, two, three, four health, bring them in right there. They're dazed. They're not going to do anything. So back over to the rival. The rival is going to deploy this tactician with health two on the number two spot. They have no tactics to play. They're going to move into movement. So you'll notice on this particular arena, there are actually three different priorities lines. This is probably the most complex arena in terms of what the rival wants to move towards, what they want to attack. There is a line for Sea Strider. Sea Strider is the local Primus. So if you were fighting a Primus event here, then Sea Strider would have his own line of priorities. So in this event, we can ignore that. There is a line for archers. Archers are going to behave a little differently here because of the mountain, because of the way this works. They have their own set of priorities to help them maximize how this arena functions. And then we have all others. And the Demacharius is not Sea Strider, is not an archer. They're going to fall into the all others category. So they want the flag holder. There's no flag holder. They want the highest hex in range of an opponent or the strongest opponent. 
So the highest hex in range of an opponent for them is going to be way over here. Basically, all of these hexes go up. So the highest hex in range of an opponent and their range is 1 would be here or here. So they have movement of 3, and they're going to go 1, 2, 3 to get as close to this as possible. Tactician, although they are dazed, has tactical, which, if you'll remember from earlier, means they can move the turn they come out. Their targeting is going to be exactly the same. They want to get here or here. So they're going to go 1, 2, 3, and I'm already being rushed. But that's OK. I think we can handle this back over to my turn. I think we want to bring in Kraken Lance. Let's just break out the big guns. Kraken Lance can move the turn he comes into play, which is important. And he also lets me play tactics on units regardless of range. And what that means is I can take this stun, and I'm actually going to stun the rival Demacharius. So stun is going to go right on top of him. And this unit is fatigued until the end of its next turn. What that means is it will not move, it will not attack, it will not use its skills. You even ignore its innate skills. So this unit basically doesn't exist except for me to be able to attack and deal damage to, which is exactly what I'm going to try and do before it's back online. So Kraken Lance is going to go ahead and move up to here. And my Demacharius is going to go ahead and move up to here as well. Now, Kraken Lance is dazed. He can't attack. However, the Demacharius can. Now, right now, they have an attack of one black, one blue, and one yellow. However, if you'll recall from the beginning of the game, we have the Follow My Lead prowess. Now, Follow My Lead gives Kraken Lance tactical, which is how he was able to move and play that tactic. It also gives him Inspire, which, if we go over to our reference sheet, <clears throat> Inspire, Allies adjacent to this unit add blue to their attacks. So because the Demacharius is next to Kraken Lance and Kraken Lance has Inspire, they're going to roll an extra die. So I have to decide now who I want to knock out. And I know the Tactician is going to be dealing a little bit of consistent damage at a time, but I think it's more important to knock out this attacker as soon as possible, hopefully before they even get an attack off because they're pretty big. So I'm going to go ahead and attack for four. And I got two hits. Two hits is not as good as I wanted, but it could have been a lot worse. So they're down to two, not too shabby. Ultimately, I just want to knock them off of there so I can start getting King of the Hill points, because that's how I'm going to win. Back over to their turn, they're going to bring in their Tribune, the Defender, one, two, three, four, five, over here on spot one. He's dazed, he can't move or do anything else. They have no tactics. So we're basically going to move ahead all the way to the engage step. Now you'll remember, this unit is currently stunned. So they're not going to do anything. The tactician is going to attack this unit here. So they have one red attack die. But because they have the high ground per the arena rules, so they are one hex higher up than the unit they are attacking, they're also going to get a bonus black die. So they're going to deal potentially two damage to my unit. But my unit has the retaliate keyword, meaning if I survive the attack, I deal one damage back to that tactician. So they roll. They get two hits. I kind of knew that was coming. I had a feeling two damage is dealt to my unit, and one unit is dealt back to their unit. And now their turn is over, and this stun tactic clears and goes back to the supply. So I bought myself a turn at the cost of my tactic. I don't get that tactic back unless I earn it back. So I get to bring in, let's see, because I sacrificed that opportunity, I get to bring in up to two more units if I want. And because it's a sport event, I absolutely want to do that. So I have a Reptilian who's pretty tough, a Defender who's tough, but really I kind of want the damage right now. I want to clear this out. I'm not too worried about that Defender. So I'm going to bring in the Harpoonsman because they've got a little bit of range. It's going to be a moment before they can use it, but that's all right. We'll bring them in right over here. I don't think I want to play any more tactics right now. I think I can handle this without spending any more. So I'm going to go ahead and take a chance and not play any tactics this turn. So we're going to move right ahead. I don't have any abilities that I want to use. We're going to jump right to the engage step. Now, this unit has two health left. If I defeat it, I won't take retaliate. So I think I'm going to have Kraken Lance go ahead and try and make that attack. 
Kraken Lance has a green, a blue, and a yellow right now. So I have an okay chance of defeating that unit. If I fail, my Demacharius can come in and make that hit if I need to. But hopefully, Kraken Lance is not able to get the job done. So one damage is dealt, and then Retaliate deals one back. That is unfortunate. So I'm trying to decide now, do I want to use my Demacharius to knock out theirs, or take out this Tactician who is probably going to kill mine? So I want to know what this unit is going to do on their turn. Are they going to go after my hero, who has some health to spare, or the Demacharis? So I look, and they're looking at the highest hex in range of an opponent. That's where they want to go. They're already there. So they want the strongest opponent, so they would attack my hero. I can tank that hit, I think. It's close. I might die, but that's okay. I want to knock out this Tactician. So I'm going to go ahead and let my unit, a black, two blue, the extra one because of Inspire, and a yellow, go for this Tactician here. So we're going to go for that. We're going to roll. Of course, now I roll three hits. We're going to knock this Tactician out, and we can just put them face down over here. That's going to be the end of my turn. Back to them. So they have no one else to deploy. They have no tactics to play. This unit is right where it wants to be. The defender is going to go ahead and try to move up. They want no flag holder, highest hex in range of an opponent. So that's going to be right here for right now. So he's going to go ahead and move one up, nice and slow, to the engage step where this unit is attacking my hero. And this could be bad, because not only does he have all of these, because he has the high ground, he gets an extra die. So we're going to go ahead and give this a roll. Oh, so lucky. He deals just one damage to my hero. Over to my turn, we're going to go ahead, move the Harpoonsman up. I don't think I want to deploy just yet, because I don't think I need to. We'll move this unit up here, and then we'll go ahead and we'll move Kraken Lance over here, and we're going to let this unit attack the rival Demacharis and try to clear off both of these spots. And they get nice big attack, plenty to defeat this unit. Because it is defeated, Retaliate does not trigger. This unit goes face down over here. This tactic goes back to the supply, and that is going to be the end of my turn. So things get a little bit faster towards the end of sport events. There's less to manage for the enemy, but it's still important. I'm still looking at this, trying to figure out how I can minimize the damage taken. So their defender is going to move up, and because he can attack my unit, he's going to. He does not have the high ground. That's good. He only rolls one black die, and he does do one hit which incidentally does a retaliate damage. So there are instances where you might accidentally defeat the rival Tribune. Back to my turn, I finally have a unit that starts a turn on a key hex. That means I can start earning my King of the Hill points. So I'm going to earn one King of the Hill point. I'm going to put this here. I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and bring in my Reptilian, because I have a plan. Reptilian comes in with three health. He's going to come in right down here. I'm going to, I'll go ahead, I'm actually going to move Kraken Lance back and move the Harpoonsman up by one. And I think that's how we're going to play that. And you'll see my plan in a second. On their turn, the defender is going to move right here because they want the high ground. And they're going to attack the strongest opponent, which is going to be this Harpoonsman. They have the high ground, they're going to roll two black dice. Ooh, both hits. My Harpoonsman is knocked out. But again, I don't mind that much because this is only a sporting event. Notice, I put my defeated units face down as well. This is important because you may find yourself forgetting as you go how many units you've deployed based on how many you're allowed to deploy. So I can check and go, well, I have three in play and one face down. That means I've deployed four, and I know I was allowed to deploy four. I can't bring anybody else in. So that is a good reminder. On my turn, I still have a unit on a key hex. I'm going to earn another point. And I think I'm going to back Kraken Lance away some more. And I'm going to go ahead and move this Reptilian up one. And I'm going to go ahead and use Kraken Lance or the Demacharis to play this hamstring on this unit. I didn't want to spend that tactic, but I think it is important. So on their turn, 
the defender has a target. Let's see, they want the highest hex in range of an opponent. That is what they have. This is the highest hex on the map, and it is in range of an opponent. So they're just going to go ahead and try to finish off the Demacharius. They're on the same level, so he only rolls his regular attack, which is going to finish them off. So that is unfortunate, but it's going to be okay. On my turn, I'm actually going to move the Reptilian over here, and that's all I'm going to do. Over to their turn, the Defender is going to come down the mountain after me. And you'll see why I made the move that I did in a moment. On my turn, and remember, he can't attack me because he's got hamstring on him, I'm going to go ahead and move the Reptilian up one, and I don't think I'm going to attack. On his turn, he's going to go ahead and move here, and because he moved, he can't attack me. My turn, I'm going to slide over here, and I think I've just about got this. On his turn, he's going to attack me for two black dice because he's got the high ground, but it's not enough to kill me. He deals me two damage, but it should be okay because on my turn, I'm going to move in here, and I'm going to use my Regen 1 ability. I haven't been able to use it up to this point because I had all the health I could possibly have, but because I've taken damage now, I can use the Regen 1 ability during the ability step, which is going to give me one health back. And this is where I pretty much have this one, because as you'll see, back to his turn, he can now only attack me with one black die. So he'll attack me with one, he deals me one, that's okay, because on my turn, I earn a point, and I go ahead and use my regen ability to gain one health back. So at this point, I have won this event. You can play it out if you want to, but there is nothing that the rival can do to beat me, because he can only deal me one damage. So I'm going to go ahead and call it a victory and move on to my reward step. So I can take my units back. Kraken Lance did take a little damage, so he's down to three. And then I can take the rival unit. I'll put him over there. We can put all the health chips back off the board. Let's see, the Tribune chip can go back to the arena chips. I did spend that hamstring, which is a little bit of a bummer. But now, I get to choose my sport rewards. And for sport rewards, you have two choices. One, you can get tactics. So remember, my tactic capacity is three. I currently only have one. So that means I could go over here to the tactics and take any two that I wanted. So hamstring is actually really good. I might just take two hamstrings. However, you can also recruit. So recruiting is taking any of the units from the rival lineup and adding them to your own lineup. Now, the catch here is I have a leadership of one, two, three, four, five, and I already have one, two, three, four, five units. So if I want to take another unit, I have to get rid of one of my own. And it's tempting. I would probably take this Demacharius if I didn't already have one, and I don't want to get rid of my Defender. So for my rewards, I'm going to go ahead and take a hamstring, and I will take two hamstrings after all, and we'll take all of these rival chips, and they're just going to go in the rival bag. So that is a sport event, and now let's move on and talk about what would have happened if my hero had actually been defeated. Now we're going to talk about the most fun part of the game, losing. Just kidding. But we are going to touch on what happens when your hero's health is reduced to zero and ways you can deal with that or circumnavigate that. So in the scenario I have set up, we are in Kunlun. The fight has gone very poorly. Three of my units have been defeated. That's going to hurt. But also my hero has been reduced to one hit point, and the enemy just rolled another hit, which would defeat my hero. So that is where blessings are going to come into play. You'll remember at the very beginning of the game, based on the difficulty we chose, we got a certain number of blessings. In this case, we chose the middle difficulty, we got four, and if we look at our sheet, we haven't used any of them yet. That's perfect, because our hero being reduced to zero would normally cost us the game. If we had no blessings left, that would be it, game over. Luckily for us, we have four. So we're going to take our sheet, we're going to mark off one of our blessings, reducing us down to only three left for the rest of the game, but our hero is going to immediately recover to full hit points. And we have seven hit points, so we're going to go ahead and give them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is basically indicating our hero has the favor of the gods. They're rooting for our hero 
against Pluto. Obviously, Pluto is not one of the gods who's on our side. And seeing him about to die, they step in and said, no, no, not today. We've got your back and heal him to full. So our hero being defeated is one way we can utilize those blessings. The other way you can utilize those blessings, and this might be a little bit of a waste, but we're going to do it right now anyway, is by spending your blessing to recruit bag units up to your leadership. So we have a leadership of six. We've got four units around right now, but I might want some more units. So I'm going to go ahead and recruit two random bag units at the cost of a blessing. Now again, I don't recommend utilizing it in exactly this scenario because you're not maximizing the effects, but that is the alternate use for blessings outside of saving your hero's life. So remember, if you have no blessings left and your hero is reduced to zero hit points, that would cost you the game. However, you do have another out, another way to avoid that. Because again, this is a long campaign and you want to survive as long as possible and hopefully make it to the Scion at the end. So let's dial it back a minute and pretend we're still at one hit point. Now we know if we get out of combat, we can spectate, we can heal up, and you know, we, can, we can get strong again before going into more combats. So we might decide before we even let the enemy have another turn, we might look at this dire situation and say, gosh, I don't think I'm getting out of this alive. I think it's time to throw in the towel. I am just going to surrender. So you can surrender any combat event at any time when you're traveling the world, obviously Primus events you cannot surrender and the Scion event you cannot surrender. But a normal bloodshed or a normal sport event, you can just, you can just quit. You can walk away, you can say, I'm, I'm done, you win, just please don't chase me, put that spear down and walk away. So we're going to leave combat with our hero. We're gonna go ahead, clear the rival board. We would resolve combat in pretty much the same way, putting units back in the bag. If it was bloodshed, we wouldn't get our defeated units back. They would go in the bag as well. But when you surrender, you do not get combat rewards, and you gain Scion influence in the same way as if you spectated. So in this instance, if we were in Act 1, we would get one more Scion influence. So it is another way the game ramps up in difficulty, and you want to use those surrenders very sparingly. And because we know we're going to have to go spectate and rest and heal, you probably don't want to let the fights go too long if you see that they're going poorly. It makes more sense to surrender early and maybe be able to take more events before you spectate than let your hero get down to nothing and be forced to both surrender and immediately spectate, which is going to give you a lot more Scion influence. So those are the ways that you can deal with defeat, you can you know, navigate it, you can kind of avoid it, and hopefully get through the game and to the Scion. Now, I mentioned that the Scion influence is one way the game ramps up in difficulty, and next, let's take a quick look at the other way the game ramps up in difficulty, which is act modifiers. So as you progress through the game, apart from the Scion influence ramping up and adding more banes to the bag, each act is going to get progressively more difficult. So if you look at the quick reference on the back of your manual, at the very bottom you're going to see a section marked Combat Act Modifiers. And basically that's going to tell you how you change up the rival lineup and how that lineup comes into play based on which act you're in. So for Act 1, there are no modifiers, and you may have noticed a little bit in the previous events, Act 1 events aren't too bad. Oftentimes you outnumber the rival, or you have the opportunity to outnumber the rival, and really the first act is kind of a feel-good act on your journey. It's get, get strong enough to basically take on the second act, because the second act is where it really starts to ramp up. So in Act 2, it tells you, add a bag unit with a tactic to the end of the rival lineup. So basically, every event you take, the rival is going to have one extra unit, and that unit is always bringing a tactic with them. So already that is a large step up in difficulty. One whole extra unit is not a small deal. Even in Act 1, you can have some very close events. Now, when you get to Act 3, you still have that bag unit and their tactic, so these sort of stack. You're always going to have the previous one plus something new. So in Act 3, you have that unit with their tactic, and the rival is going to deploy two units instead of one on their first turn each combat. So again, in Act 1 and even in Act 2, you can kind of let the rival come to you, you can play the spatial game a little bit, and really manipulate them on the field of battle. 
By the time you reach Act 3, you've got two coming out at the beginning, heading right for you. It becomes a lot more difficult and a lot more challenging right out of the gate. So you have to build your squad a little bit more carefully, build your hero a little bit more carefully. And lastly, when we get into Act 4, not only do they get the extra unit and tactic, not only do two units deploy on turn 1, but those two units that deploy on turn 1 both come into play with two additional hit points. So they're coming out fast, they're coming out strong, and they have a larger lineup. So these act modifiers are in play for all of the events that we've already talked about. So you use these for bloodshed events through the four acts, and you use these for all of the different types of sports through the four acts. However, you ignore these modifiers when you reach the Primus fight or the Scion fight. And we're actually going to go ahead and take a look at a Primus fight next. So Primus fights, which you're going to face at the end of your first three acts, behave just a little bit differently than the other combats you play leading up to them during the act. So the other combats have a little card that you draw, obviously, from your deck that guides your lineup and guides your special rules. Primus fights do not have their own card, and they ignore the act modifiers that we just touched on. They are going to be preset, and there's a little section in the book on page 30 that is going to tell you how to preset each Primus fight. So here at the end of Act 1, down on our map, we have reached the Kunlun capital, and we are ready to face Bingxing. So we turn to page 30 in the book, and it tells us in Act 1, Bingxing is going to have six hit points when she comes in. So the Primuses, as you go, are going to be stronger and stronger, but not using the Act modifiers, rather using their own little chart here in the manual. It also tells you what the rival lineup is going to be. So our lineup is four, including our hero. The rival lineup is actually three locals with the Primus at the end bringing a tactic in. So we know Bingxing is going to come in here, and as a defender, we know that she's going to bring in a stun. Now, before her in the lineup are the top three local units. Now, we didn't empty this stack, so that means two of them are actually coming into play, one, two. Because this last spot can't be filled with a local, we're going to replace it with a bag unit. So the Primus fights reward you for spending a little bit of time in their region to clear it out. Otherwise, you may be overwhelmed with local units who, as you already know, get local advantages on their arenas. So this little section in the book is very brief. You're only going to refer to it, obviously, at the end of those first three acts just to set up your Primus fight. And how a Primus fight functions is very, very similar to a bloodshed event. Primus fights are also lethal, meaning that your units who are defeated are going to go away and you're not going to see them again. So you have to keep that in mind. And the goal of a Primus event is defeat all the rival units. So you don't win simply by defeating the Primus. You've got to defeat all of them. The Primus is just going to be the most difficult. So you would play this out just as you played the normal bloodshed events. And if you're victorious, you're going to get some special rewards. A victory in a Primus fight is going to heal your hero to full. It is going to give you a hero prowess. And if you lose too many units, it's going to let you recruit some bag units up to five. So it's not going to send you off into the next act having to spectate a bunch right away. It lets you kind of catch your breath and hit the ground running as you go into the next act. And hopefully, if you make it through the first three acts and defeat the first three Primuses, you will be well equipped to get through the fourth act and fight your Scion, which is what we're going to take a look at next. All right, so you've made it through three acts, you defeated three Primuses, and you limped your way through act number four all the way to Vesuvius, and you're ready to take on the Scion. Now, the Scion is going to be different from anything you've faced earlier in the game, and each Scion is uniquely different from each other. So even though I'm going to show you one of the Scions today, you're going to have to discover the other seven and their idiosyncrasies on your own. So we've made it here, and we know that we're going to fight Tautier. So the first thing that's going to happen when you get here is you're going to do something with the bag, the banes, and your remaining blessings. So pretty much every scion you face is going to get a certain buff based on how many banes were added to the bag during the game. So on their little reference card, there's going to be some setup instructions that are going to tell you what to do with those banes. But before we actually get to what Tautier is going to do with those, we have something to do with blessings that we have left. Obviously, you're here in Pluto's domain. Your blessings are not going to help you. They're not going to save your life. But if you've gotten to the finish line with any remaining, you can basically cash them in here. We have one left. We're going to cross it out, and we're going to use it 
to remove a bane that was previously added from the game. So we're gonna find a bane from the bag and we're just gonna put it back in the bane stack over there. So that's gonna make this fight a little bit easier, not a ton. If I had managed to save more blessings, I could have been a little bit better, but you do what you can with what you have. So now that we've done that step, we're gonna take a look at Tautier, whose setup instructions read, before combat, remove all banes in play, so that would be from your camp and from the bag, from the game. Primuses, Tautier deploys, have health equal to the number of banes removed this way. So Tautier is actually gonna be bringing in some big strong friends to fight. And it also says minimum of three. So that means you can't, even if you got to this point with no banes, they would still come into play with three. But three is pretty good if you manage to get here with no banes. So you can use arena dice to track what this number is going to be. So basically I'm going to sort through these very quickly and I'm looking to see how many banes we added. One, two, three, four, five. So not too good, not too bad. Five is pretty okay. So I'm gonna grab an arena die and I'm gonna set it over here as a reminder that when Tautier brings in friends, they're gonna come in with five hit points. So that's manageable, but we'll see, uh, we'll see how it goes. Everything else you can kind of set off to the side. Uh, we don't wanna put it in the bag because we're not done with our setup instructions yet. Line number two, before combat, empty the draw bag, so we've already done that, and add all unused and defeated Primuses to it. So we have a stack off in our tray in the box of all the Primuses we've beaten so far, plus the ones that we didn't even use this game. And we're gonna take all seven of them and plop them right in the draw bag, and those are the unhappy customers we really don't wanna see. So we'll get to how Tautier is going to activate in a moment. We're gonna put him here. He has a hit point uh, value of six. So let's go ahead and health him up. And before we dive in with how this combat is going to play out, let's talk about some differences in terms of how Scion combat operates versus everything else so far. So from a win condition standpoint, you wanna defeat the Scion and certain cards will have different requirements or force you to go about them in different ways. The Hydra, for example, brings in Hydra heads. You have to defeat the Hydra and all the Hydra heads to win that combat. Um, in this combat, let's see, it doesn't specify anything unique, so we just have to defeat Tautier, so not too bad. In terms of our lineup, unlike previous events where we are capped, we can only use so many through the course of the entire event, Scion events let you use your entire roster, but only so many at a time. So you'll notice the little icon here of the hero's helmet and the number, in this case four, that's telling you you can have four units in play at a time in this combat. However, as they get knocked out and defeated, you can bring other units in. So the Scion fight is really where your leadership stat comes in handy. As you play the game up to this point, you may be looking going, well, these lineups aren't too bad. Well, the Primus fights get a little tough, but mostly I only need three or four or five units. The Scion fight is where it really pays off to have pushed that value up, eight, nine, 10. In this case, we got here with seven, and seven might or might not be enough. That is a borderline value. But again, this is dictating how many you can have in play at a given time. So the second difference is there are basically two rival steps to Scion events. First of all, the Scion himself is going to act, and he has a very unique way of acting that we'll look at momentarily. After you've gone through the Scion's action himself, if he has allies, like those Primuses that we set aside, they would take a normal rival turn as we've seen in all the other events. Uh, there's no deploy step, obviously, because we don't have a lineup, but they would use tactics. If they had tactics set aside for some reason, they would move just like normal. They would have their engage step, they'd have their ability step, everything just like that after the Scion acts. And sometimes they'll do multiple things. Sometimes the Scion on their turn will make their allies act, and then their allies will act again. As far as priorities go, at this point, you can basically ignore the Vesuvian arena rule. In some cases, you'll want it handy, but by and large, you can set that aside and bring in the Scion reference sheet because typically the Scions bring their own priority system to this combat. For Tautier, it's very straightforward. Everybody is looking to beat up on the strongest opponent. So I know if I bring Kraken Lance, my hero in right away, he's probably gonna take a beating. 
So first things first, step one is very similar to every other combat. The scion is going to deploy, the scion is going to be dazed, so the scion is basically going to do nothing on their first turn, just like us. So over to our turn, and we're not going to play a whole combat, so I'm not too worried about the ramifications of this. I'm going to go ahead and bring in Crack and Lance, just so we can get this show on the road. Now, back over to Tautier. Here is how scions are going to operate. You will notice at the top of their card here, they have a long list of dice. Don't worry, those aren't all attack dice. They're, um, let's say, meaner than that. So first of all, let's gather up all of those dice. So we have one red, we have two black, we have two green, we have, oh, all four blue dice, that's not good, and two yellows. So at the start of the Scion turn, we're going to roll all of these. All right, so we've got some hits, we've got some misses, and now what we're going to do is we're going to go down this sheet based on what we had for hits and misses using these colors in this order and trigger these effects. So at the very top is the green effect. So we're going to find both of our green dice. We have one hit, we have one miss, and the green effect says total hits, so that will be one. Tautier moves number of hexes. So Tautier is going to move one hex, and our hero is the only unit in play, so Tautier is coming for our hero. So that's the green dice. We'll move those aside. Next is black dice. We have two hits. Again, total hits. Tautier deals number of damage to its target, so that would be two, but if we double check Tautier's range over here on his reference sheet, it's only one. So he's not adjacent yet, so thank goodness we dodged that attack of two. Now we're going to go to blue. We have two blue hits and two blue misses. Total hits. On two plus hits, Tautier deploys a random Primus from the bag. Well, we got two, so Tautier's first friend is coming to join us. So we're going to randomly grab, we got Virago, and we remember from over here, instead of the printed six hit points, Virago is going to come in with five. So one, two, three, four, five. The lowest number deployment hex is number one. So Virago is going to go there. And then lastly, we have red and yellow, and we have three hits. Oof. So this is total hits, and Tautier's weakest ally gains that much hit points. So Virago is going to go all the way from five to eight. So not super nice. Virago is now healthier than Tautier. So this is going to become an interesting choice of do we even worry about Tautier's allies, or do we just focus on Tautier and what we can do? But you'll notice at the very bottom, before we get to the priorities here, there's some more text. So Tautier didn't just come with all of those skills, Tautier has some passive abilities as well. So in this case, Tautier has the ability Protected. And Protected reads, Tautier ignores all damage it is dealt until three or more Primuses have been defeated. Set the defeated Primuses beside the arena to track. So basically, Tautier can't even take damage till we've knocked out three allies. So this is looking more and more brutal by the minute. But it's over to us, let's go ahead and, mm, the Magma Rager does a fair amount of damage. Let's go ahead and bring in the Magma Rager over here, and hopefully they don't get hit right away. And I'm gonna go ahead and move Kraken Lance over here and just try to, uh, try to stay safe for right now. So let's do one more Scion turn. We're gonna take all these dice, we're gonna give them a roll, and if you're wondering why Virago didn't move, remember Virago still enters dazed, so Virago would not have moved. She does have first strike, but I was not in range. So anyway, we rolled two green. So Tautier is going to move one hex because we got one green hit and one miss. So Tautier is now adjacent to our hero. We rolled two black dice, so Tautier is going to do two damage off of the two hits. We just can't seem to miss with those. So two damage already. On blue, oh, three hits. That means another Primus is coming in. So we're going to go ahead and fish one out. We got Bingxing. And as you'll recall, Bingxing is going to come in with one, two, three, four, five. And with two out of three hits, Bingxing is going to get two more hit points. So following the Scion's turn, there is now the rival unit turn as normal, which Bingxing is stunned, but Virago is not. Virago is going to jump one, two, right up here, targeting our hero. This is going south very quickly. 
And they have these two attack dice, two hits. Well, that doesn't even seem fair. Our hero is already down to four health. So chances are this would not go well. That said, typically you would look at your scion at the beginning of the game and you would want to play the game specifically to that scion. In this case, going up against Tautier, I would probably take as many chances as possible to avoid adding Banes. I would go ahead and burn all my blessings to keep from dying, to keep from having to spectate, so that when I reach this point, ideally, these Primuses are coming in with just three hit points, and I can position myself to knock them out, hopefully before they get too much extra health from Tautier, because Tautier is just gonna keep buffing them up, and I wanna burn them down very quickly, otherwise, as you can see, this can get out of control very, very quickly. Tautier may not seem like a very complicated scion, but he is absolutely one of the most difficult scions in the game. And at this point, if you beat the scion, you've won the game, congratulations. And if you lose, still congratulations. The game is over, but you made it all the way to the scion, which in this game is no mean feat. Just getting here is a victory in and of itself, as you'll see as you start to play the game more and more. So that is a brief how to play Hoplomachus Victorum. I hope it was informative and thank you for coming along for the ride. Have a good one. The game of <laughs>